So where I'm going to start is, is just giving you a start with a definition of what mindfulness is. And this one is taken from uh, John Kabat-Zinn's book, Full Catastrophe Living. And he talks about mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. One of the ways we can think about mindfulness um, is using the image of a waterfall. And if we think about all our thoughts and sensations and experiences being like a waterfall, mindfulness is developing the capacity to step back from the waterfall and observe it rather than standing in it and being almost like part of it. Um, a couple of really important factors are about mindfulness that are captured in this particular definition. This isn't the only definition. And it's the, it's the bit about the present moment um, awareness. So one of the things that often people talk about with mindfulness is about this mindful awareness, awareness of what's going on in the present moment. And another important factor is this idea of, of a non-judgmental a non-judgmental stance in relation to our experience. Now, as we're human beings, sometimes we really struggle with this. You know, we, we like to make sense of things, so we often make judgments about our experience. It, it can be an automatic thing. So, what, so really this is something we aspire towards, this stance where we're saying, you know, oh, I notice that I'm having these thoughts about myself. I notice I'm giving myself a hard time at this particular moment. So, so, so this is one of the important factors of a, of a mindfulness-based approach. Use of work with mindfulness and depression, and that's really something that's been done very much in the UK. Um, a chap called Mark Williams and um, his colleagues uh, developed a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy uh, approach. And really what that was is he, he took Kabat-Zinn's eight-week course um, and included some elements of CBT into that course. And then you tried it as, a, as an approach for prevention of relapse in depression. Um, I don't know how much you're aware of depression, but if people have experienced depression um, once, the possibilities of them relapsing is over 50%. And if they've had it more than once, that then increases to about 75%. And what, what Mark Williams was looking for was a, um, an approach that could enable people with depression to decenter from their experience, to step back from their experience and look at it. Um, because he thought this was, this was really a, a really useful capacity for people with depression because often what happens is when people are depressed, what they get caught up is in a train of, a, a train of thinking that just takes them down and down and down. You know, they wake up in the morning and they're feeling a little bit hungover and they start asking themselves questions like, well, not hung over, but, uh, you know, a bit run down. And they start asking them questions like, well, why am I feeling run down? And they go, I don't know. And then they start going, oh, I don't know. What's that say about me? Oh, oh I'm a bit stupid. Oh, I'm a bit stupid. And, and you can see that that sort of train of thinking begins to move them down and down, a sort of spiral of depression. What he wanted it was, a, was an approach that could, where they could, they could notice themselves doing that and then interrupt it. That's been researched um, within the UK now, and, uh, and again, they've had some very good results in terms of, in terms of preventing um, relapse in depression. And you know, now it's, it's, uh, it's an approach which is within the NICE guidelines and use, beginning to be used quite widely within the NHS. So I'm going to start this by just asking you something. If you're... Um, you're walking along, just imagine this for a moment, you're walking along a, a country path and, uh, and you look down and just a few inches away from a foot you see a snake. Okay? 
what would that, just take, take them out. I'm not going to ask you to say it, but just tune in to what would that be like for you. Just imagine yourself in that situation. So now I'm just going to talk about, you know, stress response. So this is what goes on. So what actually happens is, when we, when we see that, um, here's the snake, here's our eye. Our, so from the visual cortex, we send two messages. We send one to the prefrontal cortex, which gives us a slower, fuller analysis of what the situation is. And we send one to the hippocampus for an immediate threat evaluation. And what the hippocampus will do is activate the amygdala. And the amygdala is about beginning to get our body ready for, um, for, for dealing with the stress. So it's quite quick, very you know, quick and dirty sometimes, this process. And the, the amygdala will, will uh, signal to the hypothalamus that, they, that we need to release um, certain hormones into, into the bloodstream. Uh, one of these is adrenaline. And the adrenaline gets our body ready. Okay, so our pupils dilate. Um, you know, our, our, uh, it's about sort of dig our digestion stops our lungs expand, etc., etc. It prepares our body. The other hormone that's released is something called cortisol. Now, cortisol, actually, the reason why it's released is concerned with uh, clotting blood and healing wounds. That's why it's released into the body. Um, but the thing about cortisol is it can re-stimulate the amygdala. So what can happen is that it, it heightens awareness and it can re-stimulate the amygdala. The other thing it does is it suppresses the functioning in our prefrontal cortex and also in our hippocampus. So these are the more reasoning bits that, 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 that can... Um, you know, that... that that actually we can work things through. So these are suppressed, these are blocked. So if we think about it, you know, you might be in a position where you, where in the past your boss has come into the room, slammed a report down on your desk and told you it's rubbish and, you know, and how come you haven't done a better job and you're sitting there going, and, you know, you can't think, your mind's in a whirl. Well, that's because cortisol has been released and, you're, you know, the more reasoning capacities or more integrative capacities are shut down. So, so, really, the point is that unless there's not another threat, unless we don't experience another threat, we, um, it will take our bodies three to five minutes to reabsorb cortisol. However, if we do experience another threat, this will keep going. And by the way, it's not just our eyes seeing a snake that can be seen as a threat in this sense. A negative thought can also activate this same process. So what this means is, I see a snake, I, you know, I, my body, I go into this stress response, I ready myself to run away. I get away from it, and I'm thinking, oh, there's a snake. What if there are more snakes around here? <laughs> so you can see I'm beginning to start thinking, you know, and what if I got bitten by one, and where would I go to? And I'm out in the middle of the country. and I, So I can really re keep that process going. Now, if we think about that from a TA perspective, what are we talking about? I would suggest, actually, what we're talking about is actually we're talking about elements within the racket system. Irrespective of what you want to call this stress response, you know, you could call it anger, fear, sadness, etc. These are our racket feelings, but this is actually what's going on in the body. Right? When we're using those, you know, those script beliefs and our reinforcing memories to keep that racket going, this is what we're doing. So I think if we're thinking about mindfulness, 
I think, um, I think mindfulness can be a really great way of getting us out, cutting through a racket. I'm going to give you a chance to do a bit of mindfulness now. So, um, and people at home can do the same. And I thought what I'd do is just do, do what's known as a three-minute breathing space with you. And th this was a technique that was actually developed by, in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And they, they uh, in terms of the practices they get people to do, they get people to do this a lot on the course, at least three times a day for about four or five weeks. Because what they want to get them to do is habituate this process into their into their, um, into the way of functioning, so that when they start feeling down, they go, oh, I need to do a three-minute breathing space. So they just stop and take time out. And a three-minute breathing space. So what I'd like you to do is just, you know, uh, shift your postures in your chair. So start by moving posture. Right? You might want to just take an, a, a sort of quite an erect seat. And, and, um, and then just... If you want to, shut your eyes. If you don't want to, just, just cast your eyes downwards with a soft focus. And I'd like you to bring your awareness to what's going on for you right now, in this moment. Noticing what thoughts are going through your mind. Noticing the emotional landscape of your mind at this moment. Perhaps noticing sensations in your body where you locate maybe your emotional feelings in your body at this moment now. And then clearly and directly gathering your attention to your breath as it moves in your body. Noticing your in-breath and your out-breath. Perhaps noticing the length of the breath. The relative differences in temperature as you breathe in and as you breathe out. And if you find your mind drifting away onto other things, as soon as you become aware of that, just noticing that, bringing it back to this breath. And then beginning to expand your awareness out from your breath. So noticing maybe where your breath moves in other parts of your body. Perhaps noticing echoes of your breath in your, in your seat, in your shoulders. Then noticing wider sensations in your body, perhaps in your legs, in your arms. And then expanding your awareness, perhaps beyond your body, to notice sounds in the environment. And then just bringing yourself back into the room where you are. 
And at this point, you would just be invited to carry on with your day. I have a question for you, if you don't mind. I yeah. Um, I also teach a little, a little bit of mindfulness skills. One of the things I find with my classes is that people, um, my, some people might find difficult to get into the, the routine of doing mindfulness. It's almost yeah. like they... They, they know it's a good idea and they enjoy it in the class, but sometimes they find it harder to, to put into practice in their own life. And obviously, I, I use my TA and all, mm. all other things to help them, but I wonder if you have um, come across the same Absolutely. problem and how you, you, have, you yeah. deal with it. I, I, think, I think one of the things about the eight-week courses is I... You know, I mean, John Cabot Zinn says, you don't have to like it, just do it. <laughs> and, uh, and I think there is something in that. You know, if people do it for eight weeks, he, his, his research on people that have done his eight-week course is that a year later, at least 95% of the people are still doing some form of mindfulness practice. Uh, and I think it is because you are expected on those eight-week courses. You know, the invitation is that you do daily mindfulness practice. And if you do that, you will see the benefits of it. And certainly, the courses I've taught, you know, I've watched people at the beginning, some quite sceptical, and in the middle, there's a like, oh, what is this? And then they get to the end, they're like, oh, this is, this is really doing me good, and I'm really into it. But it's almost like they have to go through that process to get there. And, you know, it's like I can run mindfulness days, but there's something about... And people come along and they, they'll like it, but, but there's something about you need to commit yourself to it. And that, and that takes self-discipline, you know. And, and the thing about the eight-week course is you've then got a group of people there that are all doing it and they can bring each other along. I think often... Often mindfulness can be quite a lonely practice if you're trying to do it out of a book. That makes it a lot harder to do. So that, that's my experience.